Hi to everyone who's joining us uh, in cyberspace. This is Rabbi Jared Grover. Um, what's being presented to you on this video is the first class in a new series called Revisiting Ruth. We're going to talk about the Book of Ruth. This class was held on Monday morning on May 18th. Unfortunately, uh, the class was Zoom bombed at the beginning, and it took a few minutes to get things under control. But in the process of the Zoom bombing, there were some inappropriate comments that were mentioned. And so what I decided to do for the recording is to re-record the first part of the class. So it's Monday evening right now, and I'm re-recording the first part of the class. And as you're watching this video, at some point, it's going to switch back to the class that was held um, this morning after that whole Zoom bombing thing, and you can continue with us that way. So I'm just going to repeat uh, what happened this morning in the first part of the class, my introduction to the Book of Ruth, and uh, we can prepare for the class uh, to be held next Monday. And remember that next Thursday on Erev Shavuot, Rabbi Sachs and I are going to participate in a discussion together on the themes of the Book of Ruth and their contemporary application, I think, personally, there are many. This is the most extraordinary book in the Bible. It really is. By extraordinary, I don't mean the best, although I happen to personally love this book. But extraordinary in the sense of unique, really special. In this book, um, there are no negative characters. There aren't even complex characters. There's no villains, I mean to say. All of the heroes of this story are good people, kind people, generous people. They live together in a spirit of love and harmony. There's no jealousy. We don't find attributes that are negative in the characters of this story. Maybe a couple of of slight points of negativity you can find in the characters, but they're very slight. For the most part, this is a book about good people who do good things for each other, and it stars a wonderful woman that we fall in love with the minute we meet her, named Ruth, and we fall deeper and deeper in love with her as the story goes on. Uh, but this scene, this fairy tale of everyone living happily ever after and doing good things for each other, is what makes the book extraordinary. The Bible is not a book of fairy tales, in case you haven't noticed. The Bible is a book that tries to convey moral and ethical instructions. It's hard to do that when there's no villain. It's hard to do that when there's nobody really to criticize. Where is the message? What is the point of including this book in the Bible? Well, our sages, no surprise, ask this same question. Let me read to you from the Talmud, where the Talmud asks, Why the Book of Ruth? Megillah zo ein ba lo tum'ah ve lo tahara. This book, this scroll of Ruth, there's no purity and impurity, lo isur ve lo heter, there are no positive laws or negative laws, ve lama nichtava, so why is it written? Here is what they answer, our, our rabbis in the Talmud, le lamdeh kama sachar tov le chasadim, to teach us the good rewards of those who practice deeds of loving kindness. This is not a book of laws, according to the rabbis. It's a story where good things happen because people are good to each other. And the message is, if people would just look out for their neighbor, love their neighbor as more than themselves, the world would be a completely different place. Incredible miracles would happen. This is a, a totally different world than the one in which we live. We live in a world where there's lots of jealousy. 
Lots uh, of fighting each other, competition, friendly and unfriendly. Um, it's so popular that one of the most popular TV shows is called Survivor uh, nowadays. You've all seen Survivor. Survivor is a show where there's a bunch of people living on an island or in some far off place and the winner is the one who stabs everybody else in the back and exceeds to win the competition at everyone else's expense. So the winner is good at plotting against the other person. The winner is good at sort of conniving a way to get to the top. That's also not the real world. I think the real world is somewhere in between the world of Ruth and the world of Survivor. But we're meant to relate to that world According to the sages, the world of Ruth, not as some fairy tale, but in a world that we could actually bring into reality. Just like we could bring the world of Survivor into a reality series, if we chose, we could bring the world of Ruth into a reality series. And they say, look what good happened in this story. Imagine all the good that could come into the world if people were just kind to each other, and only kind to each other, like we find in the book of Ruth. So that's the way our sages look at the book. And what I'd like to do is also introduce two critical readings, critical, scientific, academic sort of readings of the, of the book of Esther. Uh, Esther, I meant the wrong scroll, the book of Ruth. Here's the first critical read. What academics say about the book of Ruth is uh, that this was written as a response to rumors about King David. So let me explain. In the first book of Samuel, before David became a king, uh, the Bible says that he ran off to seek shelter with the king of the Moabites, and he and his family found protection with the king of the Moabites. That's in the first book of Samuel. Now we know later in David's life, the relations between the Israelite kingdom and the Moabites deteriorated tremendously. The Moabites were an enemy of Israel during the time of the Davidic monarchy. And it's possible uh, scholars say, that there were rumors circulating that David could not be trusted to fight for the interests of the Israelites because he had friendly relationships with the king of Moab in his youth. It's sort of like what people say about Trump and Russia, that he can't be trusted to represent American interests when it comes to Russia because there must be some backstory, some cozy relationships that he had with Russian, Russian leaders or Russian oligarchs from back when he was a businessman. And uh, the rumors therefore circulate that he doesn't have the kingdom's interests at heart or the American people's interests at heart. Well, when there are rumors circulating, just like uh, we do today, denial is one way that we can try and quash those rumors, for sure. Denial's an effective method. It's not just a river in Egypt. But there's an even better way to squash those rumors, and that is to manipulate them to complicate the story. And what scholars say is, David could have instructed his scribes to write this fairy tale about David's own great-great-grandmother, Ruth, but make his Moabite great-great-grandmother into the most lovable woman that you've ever seen, so that you fall in love with this Moabite woman and you understand that not all Moabites are bad. And you understand why David had cozy relationships with the Moabites and their king um, when he was younger. 
And that's better than denial, isn't it? Denial, it didn't happen. But you might, you know, when there's a verse in the Bible that says it did happen, you're going to be in trouble. So better than denial, manipulate the story. Change the facts. Throw out some fake news. And uh, that could be what some scholars say is the reason behind this book. To give a backstory to explain why David was once upon a time friendly with the Moabites. It was all about his wonderful great-great-grandmother. Okay, the second critical read of the story has to do a little bit more with a debate on when the story was written. If this story was written uh, during David's kingship, then the explanation that I just offered about uh, David's cozy relations with the Moabite king, then that would make sense. But actually, what many scholars say is that this book was written much later. It was written at the time when um, the Jews came back, returned to Judea from the Babylonian exile under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, why is that important? Well, for most of, the bib of biblical history, we know, all the way from Abraham, that Jewish men, or Israelite men, were marrying foreign women, and it was not such a problem. We have stories uh, here and there. You know, when Abraham is looking for a wife, for his son Isaac, he says, don't go to the Canaanite women. But he doesn't say, go find another Jewish woman. There are no other Jewish women. Um, his problem is with the Canaanites in particular. Uh, but that's one exception to the rule. Throughout the Bible, Israelite men are marrying non-Jewish women, and it's not a problem. These women simply assume an Israelite identity after they marry, and of course their children are Jewish. The religion of the father um, is what the child assumes in biblical times. Now, that uh, seems to be a problem for Ezra and Nehemiah after the return from Babylonian captivity. And we're, what we're going to jump into now in my class uh, from this morning, I'm going to show you the verses in, Ezra and Neh in the book of Ezra where Ezra is angry with the people for um, abandoning Judaism, and he describes the physical um, manifestation of that abandonment is their marrying foreign wives. So... The rules change in the period of the return. And Ezra gets upset. You're going to see in these verses as we go to the class. And maybe this story of Ruth, a story of not just a foreign woman, but a Moabite foreign woman, might be a polemic against Ezra who's saying all these bad things about marrying foreign women, well, here comes the book of Ruth to say, guess what, everyone? If we weren't allowed to marry foreign women, there would be no Ruth. There would be no marriage between Ruth and Boaz. And there would be no Davidic dynasty, because there would be no Davidic kingdom. So maybe the book is a polemic. This is a, a third critical reading, and now we're going to go to my class. Some of this might be repeated, and um, I hope that you enjoy learning about this book and fall in love with it as much as I love, uh, as much as I love it. Uh, you know, by the way, I didn't mention it, that this is special for Shavuot because the book takes place during the barley harvest. The main story of the book takes place during the barley harvest, and that occurs in the holiday uh, of Shavuot in the agricultural character uh, calendar. So uh, that's why we're having this class now. We're also having this class now, by the way, because it's Victoria Day. And we should celebrate strong royal women. And Queen Victoria is a strong royal woman. 
And look how we have our own Queen Victoria in our Bible, Ruth, to look up to, I think, in the same way. Be well.